welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are here with a brand new season of Halting Toward Zion. So if you've ever been curious about world history or church history or how the two relate, or really anything tangentially remotely related to those topics, this is the podcast for you. Uh, let's reintroduce ourselves since we've been on a little bit of a hiatus. Um, Greg, why don't you go first? My name is Greg Ottinger. I have been teaching Christian school for 40 some years, mostly high school. I teach theology and history appropriately enough for what we're going to be talking about now for the next several months. I'm a writer of various sorts, although a lot of it is ghost-written. The uh, original seasons of Halting Toward Zion were taken from things I ghost wrote for a friend of mine. This one is coming from all kinds of sources, and we're largely going to make it up as we go. <laughs> I'm sure so, no one is surprised. No, yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> I am an elder in the Reformed Church of the United States. But I'm now retired from active service. Yay. Hey, congratulations. This is, in theory, is buying me more time. Ha. Huh. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's who I am. And you get to find out more about who I am and who we all are by listening week by week. And then here's <laughs> Rachel. Sure. So I am happy to be here. My name is Rachel Wojtek, and I have a background in um, studying government history, uh, particularly the Middle East. So you will often hear me talk about that. Uh, for the, the past 10 years, I have been teaching uh, at the same Christian school as Greg and have spent a lot of time uh, in history, as well as teaching a whole assortment of other things, but I am now uh, working in the background for that school and am doing administrative things um, as I support my new husband, David, not the same David as Emily's David. Um, <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> no. Uh, See, this so we is great. Lots. We go from having Brian, who is married to another Emily, to having Rachel, who is married to another oh. David. <laughs> Yes. So <laughs> to keep it interesting, right. uh, we love to have the same name everywhere, uh, but it seems to be the way with Bible names. And so my David, as I call him, uh, is a new pastor here in a small town in uh, called Willows in California. And we are just getting our ministry started and excited to be still involved in lots of things, including sharing our knowledge with people or for me teaching about history. Mm -hmm. And you've been teaching church history specifically for quite some time. Yes, that has been my mm -hmm. specialty because both in my study of the Middle East as well as in teaching, I love the, the connection that we should always be seeing between what people believe and how they act. Uh, mm -hmm. So our religion and our politics uh, should not be separated. No controversy in that statement whatsoever. I know, not at all. <laughs> yeah, we're so excited to have you with us. When we when we thought about what we wanted to do next, uh, world history and church history were both kind of top of the list. And we thought, well, you know, it would be really great. It's not going to happen, but it would be really great <laughs> if we could get Rachel. Yeah, because <laughs> so, she'll be too busy teaching school and all. She'll be too busy. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, but I'm no longer change. teaching, so <laughs> I'm helping all the teachers that took over all my jobs um, learn how to teach the classes that I taught. So, yeah, yeah. I heard it took like five or six people to replace you. So not surprised. <laughs> yeah, I, I taught across, across a broad range. <laughs> Including you're working on accreditation for the school. Yes. So actually, interestingly enough, uh, about... A month ago, I started developing our standards for the school, particularly in the study of history. And so many of the things that Greg is going to be drawing on for some of these, I was already reading through to try to put together because a lot of our history curriculum has been based on uh, some of the things he has written about history in terms of how we approach it and the things that we talk about. All right. Well, let's get into it. Um, what better place to start? 
been the beginning. Um, if you have already listened through Halting Toward Zion from the beginning, um, in which case I'm so sorry. Have, hasn't our recording quality improved? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but you're going to hear some some familiar content, I think, but from a different angle, because now we're doing history instead of biblical theology and sociology sort of and sociology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you, you made an interesting comment there. Um, we need to go back to the beginning and start there. But do you notice what that presupposes? That there was a beginning. That there's a beginning. Yeah. Oh, wait. That and means- we've already left paganism behind us. Yeah, haven't we? <laughs> because although Christianity presents us with a linear view of time, something that has a beginning, and with regard to redemptive history, an end, a finale, a climax, a culmination, the all of the various pagan slash non-Christian interpretations of history have a problem. They don't start anywhere. Uh, in his brief history of time, um, people are looking for some way to get around time history having a beginning because having a beginning smacks perhaps too much of it having an end. Mm. And that- That's rather insightful. It is incredibly insightful for a man who hated God. Then the thing is, in his next book, he said, oh, wait, I found a way around that. Time doesn't have a (laughs) beginning nor an end. Uh, Time space is just this, to borrow an illusion from another genre, timey-wimey kind of inner- (laughs) Spurst goop, wibbly wobbly, yeah. Uh, he he presented in far more scientific language, of course, but that's what it came down to. He managed to get around his own criticism, sort of by saying, "Yeah, there's a way you can look at time space where it didn't have to begin; it just sort of folds in on itself, and and the universe creates history as just by being what it is, and we don't we don't need to have a start; we don't need to have an end." So before that, though, he he realized something about the, the children of Adam. We don't want history to have a beginning for two reasons, at least. One, probably three. Uh, one, that means someone started it. Mm. That's awkward. Two, <laughs> it may mean that that same someone still controls it, and that would have implications. And three... Some that someone may call an end to it, may blow the whistle, or in this case, the last trump, and we may have to answer. So, on all of those counts, a linear view of history is has been traditionally unacceptable to the pagan world. Um, that changed when Augustine of Hippo, or Augustine if you prefer, um, <laughs> wrote the City of God and said, in essence, let me tell you a story. This is reality. God created the world. God had a plan for the world. God moved it through the history recorded in the Old Testament, brought it to Christ. The gospel is now spreading, and one day Jesus will come back and end this thing we call history, redemptive history, and then eternity begins. And the pagan world stood back and went, whoa, and scratched his head and said, we don't know about this because this is, this is, wow, this is a completely different worldview. Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and religion. Yeah, hmm. Uh, mm. And as the Middle Ages embraced Christianity, the idea of some kind of cycle or eternal return faded into the background until we begin to get to the Renaissance. Then it begins to sneak up again. And by the time of the Enlightenment, we're beginning to think that maybe there might be something going on, but the the post-millennial vigor of of the Reformation, particularly Puritan thought, inspired uh, the gentlemen of the Enlightenment to say, but look, great, incredible future for us. Things can get better and better. We've got reason. We got math. We can build a better, brighter future for our grandchildren and their grandchildren beyond them. And this is linear. And they didn't look at this. They were still, at the first generation, they were still sort of looking at, all right, well, there's... God, I guess. There's a God of some sort, the divine geometer with one sweep of his compasses, created the universe. 
But he got he retired and went in the background, <clears throat> having given us the world to play with. Basically, the computer programmer retired, having pushed start. And and so as we learn the intricacies of the program, we learn to be really good mathematicians and physicists. We can control history, and it's going to go in a positive direction. So why did the linear view take so long to take hold? I mean, Augustine was back what fourth century? Well, it was well, it, it existed throughout the Middle Ages, but it was it existed in a rather mild form. It comes into its. It begins to come into its own in the Reformation. the The Middle Ages, following their understanding of Augustine, uh, saw the Christendom, the medieval world, as God's kingdom. It had come. This is a closed perspective on reality, <laughs> but nonetheless, it was a sort of amillennial. Things are about as good as they're going to get. Things are not going to change very much. Christ is reigning. Europe is his dominion. There are bad guys out there, but they're out there, and we don't really have to worry about them. Islam was a threat from time to time, and as we get further into this, and it it wasn't until the Reformation came along and proved that change in a positive direction is possible in at least one area, worship. If we can reform worship, which stands at the heart of human life, if we can make it better than it was, if we can grow, then why can't things grow in other directions? And why can't this, these first steps toward a Reformation see an even greater expanse, a greater, a greater, the growth can grow? And the Puritans, particularly those who came to America, picked up on this for a generation or so and really began to hammer this. The, the church will experience a great latter-day glory before Christ returns, a millennium not introduced by Christ's return, but by the preaching of the gospel and the discipling of the nations by the church. And this is going to have spill-off. This is going to have side effects. This is going to have collateral, collateral improvement that's going to bless and affect the whole world. And they look back at many of the, particularly the prophecies of Isaiah, but throughout the prophets, there are those things that speak of the coming of Messiah and how it's going to change the world for better until everyone sends through his vine and fig tree and the nations beat their swords into plowshares, their spirits into products, all of those kind of things. And there was a generation or so that was disposed not to push them off into heaven or into an earthly millennium ushered in by the second coming, but that saw them as, as, as the fruit of the gospel. Backing up a long way. So, there's a developing and maturing of this idea of linear history. Now, when the Enlightenment came along, these, these guys looked over at Christians and said, wow, that's a worldview. It's, uh, it's powerful. It's optimistic. They, they, they want to change things. They are changing things. We could do that. We can have a worldview like that. I mean, we have this incredible tool called mathematics. We have sort of a sovereign God. I mean, he started everything up and programmed everything perfectly. Uh, we have the human mind. We have people, we have smart people, philosopher kings, scientists, technicians, who can implement plans. Many of them belong to secret societies. We won't talk about that yet. <laughs> and um, through this, we can reap the positive sanctions, the benefits of this clock-like universe. And there's no and, and there should be no end to the progress that can be made. What they didn't see and what the next generation rather not politely pointed out to them was uh, you're borrowing Christian stuff. You have you still have a creator God, and you still have these virtues. Now you think it's it's all great and, and, and cool that you picked up, you know, justice and love and kindness and respect and all those kind of things. You do realize you got that from Christianity. Well, no, we didn't. They're just natural things things evident to logic. No, you're it, making that so, up. <laughs> so ironic. Like even the image of the the watchmaker, right? Yeah. Clocks were invented by monks who wanted to know what time they should pray. <laughs> exactly. And and so we 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 have that first generation that looks for their own version of the heavenly city, but it's a man-made version resting upon logic, reason, and mathematical competence, uh, but it's still going to be people by by individuals who have these Christian virtues, and their thought was, we get the superstitious elements out of the way, the basic under, more underlying mor morality, 
will will then be set free to permeate the human race and man's basic goodness will take over and we'll we'll know using our mathematical tools how to bring about this new Jerusalem. And it's from there, it's a very short time. The next generation says, um, you're cheating. And from there, it's a very short distance to Darwin who says, um, yeah, there's a development, but it's not what you think it is. Yes, and, and, and Darwin is still borrowing capital. He's still talking about this possibility of development, of improvement. Mm -hmm. Then along comes the Lisbon earthquake that kills thousands and thousands. And we get Tennyson's brilliant line, nature red in, what is, what's the phrase, red Tooth in cl and claw. claw, you know. Uh, and people began to realize, uh, this is not necessarily going where we thought it was. And it's not too long from there to the dystopian novels that begin to say, this is not going at all where you thought it was. <laughs> and why should it? And, and so for a while, the humanists are borrowing Christian capital and they're imitating it. And there's a, a sort of rough parallel to Christian doctrine, but not enough to sustain social regeneration. Man is not good. Nature is not good. Nature is not nice. Nature is an unpleasant animal. Mm. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we keep seeing uh, this. Like we we saw this throughout um, our previous mm -hmm. arcs of halting towards Zion, where you take any one doctrine in Christianity and any one aspect of a developed Christian philosophy and isolate it from everything else, and it ruins everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely everything. wrecked. So. Unwinding now and going back to, so that's what their open-ended universe has given them. And it plays out ultimately <clears throat> on this sea of irrationality because the universe, well, okay, notice universe. We can't <laughs> even use that word because it implies a unity of plan <laughs> and intention. It's a Christian word. Uh, cosmos, well, that's a Greek word, so I suppose they get to use it. But even that, even cosmos implies some kind of order and balance. Yeah, um, Jesus used that word also. <laughs> yeah, that too. So you, you're left with this reality that we experience after some fashion that came out of chaos. And whether you're talking about the Big Bang, the explosion of some singularity that lies at the beginning of present history, or whether you're talking mythological, the gap between fire and ice, or the the great chaos from which the gods sprang, it's all the same. There is this chaotic beginning that throws up stuff that for a little while looks promising to us, because we've been uh, hypnotized by the Christian worldview, and we look for order, we look for beauty, we look for pattern, we look for story. Mm -hmm. But it's all a lie. That's It's just an accident. It's like looking, trying to find pictures in the clouds. Uh, look at the dragon up there. That's just a cumulonimbus cloud. Let it rain and uh, it'll be gone. Oh, I thought it looked It's like way a more fun for it to be a dragon. Yeah, it's more fun, and that's it. We're tempted by it, but it makes more, it's more fun. It makes more sense. It's more purposeful. Yeah, dream on. You're making it up. Let it go. The bottom is chaos. What comes out of chaos, however it masquerades for a time, is ultimately chaos. And, and back to something that I talk about a lot, uh, borrowing from Dr. Van Til and Dr. Rushuni, the idea of continuity of being. All being for the pagan, for the humanist, for the non-Christian, all being, all reality is the same kind of thing. There are no differences. There's nothing outside. I'm going to use universe just because I'm tired of trying to find a different word, or maybe reality. <laughs> there is no reality outside of reality. There is no God outside the universe, above the universe, transcended with regard to the universe, who can impress order, give direction, shed light on what in the world's going on, or use it to tell a story. That's just a dream. And the sooner we give it up, probably the happier we will be because we'll stop being frustrated trying to find meaning. Uh, Dr. Um, Greg Singer, I think is his name, a uh, Christian historian, he wrote a theological interpretation of American history, tells of uh, uh, a teacher or a historian's conference that he attended 
where there were a lot of big name, big name historians from the major universities and such. And he uh, just sort of dropped the question, um, gentlemen, why exactly do we teach history? Uh, it's, uh, and why do we require it of students? What's the point here? What's our justification? Um, well, um, I think I forgot to wash my socks. I'll be gone. <laughs> People just began to <laughs> go away because asked so baldly, they did not have an answer. Uh, when I was doing uh, notes for my what would become a almost unpublished book on epistemology, I, I came to history and I, and I thought, well, what are they saying today? And I looked it up and there was one guy who said, here are great reasons for, for teaching history. There are uh, cultural illusions. There are moral examples. There are cool stories. I think he had one or two others. Cool stories is correct. Yeah. <laughs> Except, <laughs> what's a story? What's a story? Why is it cool? Why, why should is it cool, cool? be why good? Do, why do you re resonate with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and why is cool good? Uh, and why why do we pay thousands of dollars for our children to be taught this cool stuff? Can't we just, you know, put them in front of a TV and I'm sure they'll learn plenty of cool stories that way. Why do we need stories about people who we'll never meet in cultures we don't understand that lived a long time ago and very far away? Where is all this going? And often the the answer is, and, and sadly even from Christians is, because um, we've always done it that way? Because it's on the SAT, because it's required in college and we want to make sure that we're ready to get good, good grades, because mom and dad make me. Um, I we, think the one that I read from the state of California was to make good citizens. The, mm. the government needs to teach their children the past so that they can behave in the present. <laughs> Behave. It, it, behave in the state's interest, of course. <laughs> right, because they're right. going to tell them the stories they want them to, to hear. hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what, that's what Rome did. Mm -hmm. Rome, Roman education was largely moral tales of citizens who sacrificed their pride, their honor, their lives to defend, rescue Rome from its enemies. That's about all that's there. And th this, this was, that this in the alphabet and maybe some simple arithmetic was the bulk of the average Roman citizen's education. And those Yeah, you take any of those moral examples that they no. give and make that person not on Rome's side and suddenly they're a bad guy. Yeah. Suddenly they're an immoral <laughs> example. <laughs> uh, and those same stories lingered on anybody who took Latin, that would be me, um, up into the, the 1920s or 30s. Of course, when you're learning Latin, you read Latin stories, you read Roman mm -hmm. stories, and those names continue to resonate. Mm -hmm. uh, Horatio at the Bridge, Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> Cincinnati uh, putting on his toga to receive the, uh, the, the senators who are about to make him a dictator for a day or a week or however long. Uh, the geese that, that, that quack and spoil the invasion through the secret tunnel. Um, Goose, the geese, sacred to Juno, of course. Uh, these kind of stories kept circulating, and there was a time when they did form a certain amount of the moral uh, vocabulary mm -hmm. of America. So right up there besides, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and... Um, Honest uh, Abe and George um, Washington. Yeah, so you, you had the Bible. And, and that's largely what we did as a country. We... We didn't want to go to the Bible because the Bible was controversial. We gave an official nod to it in our schools. But the curriculum we adopted, first of all, fell back on Roman stories, not Greek. We didn't like the Greeks because that was democracy and that was that was horrible. But we <laughs> The Romans taught us that the Greeks were yeah. very bad. <laughs> yes, they did. Although I actually found a quote from John Adams, and I can't even remember where I saw it, where John Adams is writing to Tom Jefferson and basically says, yeah, I'm not convinced there were any good Romans. I think all of that virtue stuff, they made it up. They claimed it. They never had it. They're all a bunch of stinkers. I need yeah. To well, John Adams again. was a Presbyterian, was he not? Uh, he was Congregationalist. Unfortunately, oh, his, chur he? his church oh, went I'm thinking of Hamilton. Yeah, his church went Unitarian. Mm -hmm. And he seemed sense. okay with that. His son protested, said, Dad, what are you... <laughs> 
the better Maybe. known, the better but lesser known Adams. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the much better, at least as far as his character and role view are concerned. Uh, but yeah, he also played a key role in in the development of America. Anyway, we, we're way off here, but <laughs> the point is, if all is one, then there are no standards outside the universe by which to judge. The, what's happening in the universe just is. And we, in our fight night, this may have conceived this idea of story, and for some reason it tickles the chemical compounds that make up our brains. But it's ultimately a foreign concept. There is no story in the universe. There's no purpose. There's no goal. There are no heroes. There are no standards. Uh, Charles Manson, the mass murderer, uh, once said, if God is one, what is wrong? And he understood very clearly. If all is one, if God and the universe are identical, then there's no right and wrong. There are no standards to appeal, to appeal to. What is, is right. Uh, the Marquis de Sade is a good example of this. If if this is the way the universe made us, and it gives me a penchant for wanting to do nasty things to women, why not? There's, there's nothing that can judge me. I'll never have to answer. We can think here of uh, Henley's poem, Invictus, out of the night that covers me dark, as the night from pole to pole, I thank whatever- Black is the pit. Black is the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there be for my inconquerable soul. And he goes on and talks about, it doesn't matter how straight the gate, alluding to Christ's words, how charged with punishment the scroll, how much the Bible threatens me with eternal punishment, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. Or not, because what's a captain and what's a soul and who do- when, uh, what do you mean in conquer? What all of these? What are these, you even going to aim for? Yeah. And wh why do we care? And yeah. And why are we, why are we listening to you? And who are you anyway? <laughs> who who are you? Becomes a good question. I, I think you've all heard me answer that or ask that question a lot of times. It's now an official part of the curriculum. <laughs> who are you? Who are and, you? and and, and the, who do you serve? And who do you? Yeah. Uh, who are you? What do you want? Whom do you serve? Who do you trust? Yes, I borrowed that, and those of you who don't know where that's from, shame on you. Um, <laughs> I can only guess. <laughs> I have an educated guess, but it's a guess. All right. well, you can think I'm about right it. with you, Emily. <laughs> you can think about it and get back to me. Uh, but it's interesting how many of my students have mentioned that in their graduation speeches or in other later papers. No one ever asked me who I was or to think about who I was or why it mattered or how I could know. Okay, well, that's sad. And so now it is an official part of, of what I do with the kids. At some point, they have to write. This is usually the, the year that the island game appears in. If you mm. don't know what that, if you people don't, don't know what the island game is, never mind. <laughs> uh, it's, an, it's an adventure story we play out in the classroom. But one of the first things is, who are you? You, you, need, to, you need to have some clue as to who you are before you can pretend to be somebody else. So if we're going to take you, you're going to play someone like yourself because you're not a good enough actor to do much else. <laughs> but we're going to take who you are and tweak it. So you need to know who you are. And that's more than just a list of, of, of skill sets. That's more than percentages on a game gaming sheet, character sheet. Uh, what are you? you? You are the image of God. You are a born-again child of God. You're in covenant with the God who made the universe, and thus with all of its people. There's a great many things. You are a creature. You're not God. And when we look to Christian, we look now away from all of the continuity of being religions, which is to say simply humanism, paganism, whatever you want to call it, atheism that denies the true God in favor of something, and we look at Christianity, things change. We have a creator who is self-existent, who made everything that's not him, who is in control of everything, including himself. He is not wild and chaotic. He is infinitely wise, infinitely loving, orderly, kind, gracious, just. And this God, who is a person, in fact, he is three persons, created the world with intention and with purpose. He has a plan. He has a story. And being the creator, he is sovereign and he has the ability to accomplish that story, to bring about his intended consequences in within the time stream, within heaven and earth. And this we call history. 
uh, Christians over the last generation or so have, have taken the word history and probably say, yes, it's his story. Well, yes, good. But now you have to come to terms with that with what that means. Mm-hmm. Imagine Tolkien writing Lord of the Rings and leaving out the fourth book because he didn't, wasn't sure what was going to happen there or what his characters would choose. But he tries to pick it up afterwards. But <laughs> <laughs> if a, a storyteller does not leave gaps and what ifs and you know role play we've, we've all done role playing that's for the, again for those of you who don't know that's interactive storytelling where someone sets out the conditions of a story and leads you through an adventure and says you walk into a room you see this and that and you respond in here here well then i go over to this and do that to that and and it's a back and forth it's like dnd but it doesn't have to be dnd yeah it's better it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's so funny how most people like if you say D and D nowadays they don't look at you funny anymore. It's, it's yeah, pretty great. I just, I just <laughs> it's the moment you, when you when you said that I suddenly realized that, that that's apparently the case or you wouldn't have just done that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Forty years ago, you did not do that. <laughs> right, people and would thus, think you were a Satanist. Yeah, and thus I coined the word. I was not the only one. It was coined simultaneously all over the place, apparently. But I was one who coined the phrase interactive storytelling because you someone's telling a story and you're you're contributing it to it. Well, it is possible to have an understanding of God where God is telling a story, but does not know the end. He has a projected end. He knows where he wants the story to go and being very wise and very creative and having the physical universe at his disposal. He can, you know, he can dump a snowstorm so you can't get where you were going. He can have an earthquake that disrupts the freeway and traffic so that that's not going to happen over there. But he can't actually control human choices because then man would be a puppet. And so God is sitting back, waiting, watching, hoping we make the choices that he would really like to see played out. Okay, this is not storytelling. A storyteller writes every single word to the last syllable of recorded time. He writes all the details. He does not leave blanks. And so when we talk about God as a storyteller, when we say history is a story, we're not saying he planned a broad outline, hoping we would fill in the rest in a way that would glorify him. Right. And this does not make us robots or puppets. No. Right. If, you, if you're reading a story, say you're reading Tolkien, Aragorn's doing what Aragorn wants to do. We have a concept of this character as existent. And we can understand him as someone who is motivated to do what he's doing. He's doing what he wants the whole time. Sauron's doing what he wants to do the whole time. Frodo's yeah. doing what he doesn't want to do, but knows that he kind <laughs> of has he to. He has to. The and thus he, d- he does choose, mm-hmm. however reluctantly, to bear the ring to Mordor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's in a different sense that Tolkien decided what all the, these people were going to do. Yeah, It's both when, true that it's when, in a different sense. And when Boromir dies, we don't try to try Tolkien for murder. Right. In another vein, we don't hold Agatha Christie guilty of the murders on the Orient Express. Or we don't blame George Lucas for blowing up Alderaan with a Death Star. Uh, There is a difference, even on the human level, between the storyteller and the story. But when we're talking about an infinite God, well, we we don't think nearly enough about infinity, probably because we can't get very far with that (laughs) thought. But when we think of a God who infinitely transcends the universe, we 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 often don't really we we think of God as Santa Claus. He's he's a big, powerful, supernatural person. Uh, He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Sure, great. But he doesn't really control everything, does he? Okay, yeah, he does, but not the way you think. When uh, when I have been asked on occasion, usually by one student, to explain to someone else, explain to them predestination. <laughs> really? Why don't you? Uh, but I, knowing what's coming while they're talking, I reach into my, into my pocket and pull out my keys. And um, as I walk to them, you want so you want to talk about the sovereign you've got, and I throw my keys toward them. Guess what happens every single time? They catch them. They catch them. <laughs> and I say, look. I knew you were going to do that. In fact, I planned for you to do that. Did you do it because I planned it or did you do it because you wanted to? Well, it just seemed the obvious thing for me to do. So I didn't make you do it, but you did it, even though I planned it and knew it was going to happen. Now, do you think God's greater than I am? (laughs) If I can pull this off, 
Do you think that God, who is infinite, can pull off this thing we call predestination, the foreordination of all things, even the death of his own son? Uh, to take it from a different direction, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? How do you take, how do you reach into nothing which isn't there? Because nothing's not a thing. And there, into that nothing, create a there for something to be, and uh, and start the clock kicking in that thereness, in that space you've created, and set matter in motion when none of this existed before. How exactly do you do that? And um, the answer, I think, is, uh, I don't know. Okay. Neither do I. When we, we figure that God's out. Word for <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When we figure that out, maybe we can talk about predestination. But until <laughs> then, let's acknowledge that there are things God can do, and he understands perfectly well. He knows how he does it. We don't. We can't. We won't. And probably even eternity, he'll not sit down and have, okay, today's lecture is creation 101. Here's how you create out of nothing. <laughs> it, it's not going to happen. Um so Christianity, the Bible, from Genesis 1-1, presents us with God, who has a story, and in fact, he has a plan. Now, he shows us just a little bit of this plan. Having created heaven and earth, and having created man, well, before he creates man, he's created heaven and earth, and we could talk about that a long time, but we won't, because that way lies rabbit trails without end. <laughs> he says, let's make man in our image. And he keeps coming back to that. Um, let me read this. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created them, he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. There's more, but that's a good place to stop. So he's talking he, he mentions man, let's make man, but immediately it's in our image. Man's going to be an image bearer of God. And part of that is he's going to have dominion over the planet. But also man is going to come in two flavors, male and female, two genders. And they, these two are going to relate to one another in a positive way, such that with God's blessing, they are going to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Have children, have children, have children. But let's be clear as to what it is that's multiplying. It's the image of God. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed to fill the earth. There's a discussion in itself, which I'll carefully avoid. The earth is not full, despite everything we've been told. <laughs> so history's not done yet. But God, from the beginning, planned to fill the earth, not with just people, with his image. Mm -hmm. But that involves understanding what in the world the image of God is, and that's where we would have to go back and read what we just skipped over. Well, how do we know what the image of God is? We read the Westminster Standards. Yes, that's great, but Adam <laughs> didn't have those. The rest of Westminster Standards are great as far as they go. They, they focus on the narrow thing of true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness of the truth, dominion over, with dominion over creation. That's, that's all good, and that corresponds roughly to man's threefold office as prophet, king, and priest. But if you go back and look at Genesis 1, well, first thing that strikes you is God's a creator. He's an artist. Mm -hmm. He's an artisan. He's an engineer. He builds things, complex, beautiful things. There's an aesthetic dimension to all of this. There is a, a, a dimension of intelligence, of taking incredibly complex things and putting them together in ways that look superficially very simple and are very beautiful and that are tremendously functional. That's the first thing we run into. Man's supposed to be like that. But he's supposed to do it as the image of God. And so the moral qualities of righteousness and holiness come in. In order for man to be the image of God, he has to walk with God, fear God, obey God, and maintain his fellowship with God. If he doesn't, he will still in some sense be the image of God, since that's what he is by definition. But that image is going to be corrupted, defiled, defaced. And God's vision here will not come to pass. So already there's this, wow, that's a great plan. We're going to, the whole world is going to be a community 
that together is going to constitute one moving mass, one body, where every human is a cell, that together makes up the image of God, not only individually, but in terms of their relationships with one another. It's almost like all of humanity were a city, a bride, a body for God. That was the plan. That's what's presented here. And in well, what, what, what is the earth? What's its function? Well, God likes the earth. He made it. But too often, the, the emphasis on, on the dominion mandate actually came originally out of Dutch circles, where it's called the cultural mandate. And the emphasis was very much on, well, man's a cultural creature. He makes stuff. And the arguments began over, well, does that stuff pass into eternity? What's its relation to the gospel? What's the relation of the, of the cultural mandate to the, to the Great Commission? Which one takes precedence? How do they fit together? And all of that stuff. And Dutch theologians gave some really good answers. Um, Henry Van Til's book, Calvinism and Culture, I recommend highly along these lines. But as far as I've seen, I, I think there is a missing dimension or maybe I just haven't read far enough. But th this is what I see and what I what God has impressed upon me for the last several years. You want to grow up and you so you want to be a Christian. You want to be godly. You want to be more spiritual than you were yesterday. Even in an unfallen world, this is a necessity. Remember that Jesus, as a as a young boy, grew up. Mm -hmm. He grew in wisdom and knowledge and a favor with God and man. In an unfallen world, there would still be a need to move beyond bare innocence. I haven't done anything wrong, to healthy righteousness. I faced trials, and I overcame because I trusted God all the time. And in an unfallen world, you can say that. I never doubted God once. Wouldn't it be great to be able to say that? <laughs> we, we, we can't say that. But in an unfallen world, they could. But they still would have to trust. And so, if you're going to grow, you need a challenge. If I, you know, the, the painting of the Mona Lisa for Leonardo presumably was a challenge. What if he painted the same painting over and over again? And what if he did it for eternity? You think he's going to grow as an artist? <laughs> Boring. <Is> he, yeah. <laughs> or as a Christian? No, you need constantly need new challenges. You, you start with something difficult, and then you need to move beyond to the next difficult thing. And sooner or later, you move out of your comfort zone into someone else's comfort zone, and you say... I, I, I'm i taking on this project and I know how to do the painting. I don't know the math behind it. I don't know the computer programming behind it. I don't, you know, and you go to someone else and you say, teach me or work with me or help me or let's cooperate. Mm -hmm. And now you're working as a team, as a body where you're humbling yourself to listen and to learn. You're growing in new directions and you together are facing challenges and you're trusting God all along. And so this whole body is growing, uh, it's feeding and growing and, and developing itself as it takes on things in, in the real world. Let me show you backwards, if that doesn't make any sense. I want to re be really godly. So I'm going to abandon the world. I'm going to go find a mountaintop someplace. I'm going to sit there. I'm not going to have any cultural products with me. And I'm going to pray and talk to God and meditate on the Bible that I know. I'm not taking even a Bible with me. And I'm going to be so spiritual. <laughs> Does that work? Ooh, That's a real no, question. It not. No, it doesn't. Not for Why? very long. No. Because you're not being challenged to look temptation in the face and refuse it. Even our Lord upon his baptism, went deliberately into the wilderness mm -hmm. to meet Satan head on. He took on the challenges. And they culminate, they culminate in Gethsemane on the cross. Though he were a son, yet learned to obedience by the things he suffered. Even though he was innocent, although he never strayed from the Father's will, he still had to face that, okay, so this is what I'm doing, right, Father? Right? This is not going to be fun. I've got it right. This is the next, this is the cross. That's where I'm going. Not your will, but not my will, but your will be done. Until finally, hey, Peter, the cup my father has given to drink me to drink. Shall I not drink of it? Even he had to grow, and he had to grow, and it involved things like gardens and swords and people with torches and clubs and all and 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 a cross. We grow as we face historical challenges in a real three-dimensional material world. 
Mm-hmm. Take that away, and you might as well be a monk sitting on a ledge someplace med- meditating on your navel. There will be no growth. And so, is there a conflict between the Dominion Mandate and the Great Commission? No, they need each other. You, we're making mm-hmm. disciples, not just winning souls to Christ. We're making disciples. And to be disciples, you have to face hardships, temptations, trials, tests, being better than you were when it's really hard. Teaching a classroom full of 50 kids who don't really want to learn theology. <laughs> and you do it with prayer and you do it in faith. And you learn, one hopes, the wisdom on how to communicate to teenagers and how to present the material and what's going to ring their bell right now and what cultural illusions can I make that are going to get their attention and what real life situations can I bring in that's going to stir them up and set them on fire so they say, oh, this is important. That's why we need the earth. That's why we need to develop a planet. Yes, because it's beautiful but also so that we can become beautiful, so that we can grow and we can be challenged. And so we're, we're not, Adam and Eve were, and, and humanity, we're not commissioned to be eternal gardeners. <laughs> They're supposed to build a city. Mm-hmm. The, the job, one of my um, econ tests or some such thing is, which, which one of these is not true? And one of the options is, Adam and Eve were to maintain the ecological integrity of the garden. No, they were supposed to glorify <laughs> it, build it, develop it. They were not to leave the garden. When we get to the end of the Bible, the gardens become a city. Oh, it's, 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 it, the city is filled with trees and rivers of water and people and beauty. But it's a city now. And the city, <laughs> urbanization is not evil. Urbanization is the goal of history. But it's the right urbanization. It's the right city. It's the city of God, not the enlightenment city of man. So we'll talk a lot more about that next time, I think. <laughs> As we begin our march through 6,000 years of human history, that's where we're going. But wait, sin. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that maybe next time. Did sin, did the fall leave God shaking his head, throwing up his hands and saying, wow, I had this great plan. They screwed it up. Oh, well, let me see if I can come up with another one. Maybe something that doesn't involve earth and bodies and humanity. <laughs> and yeah. Or did he say, watch this? And that's for next time. It is for next time. I'm going to ring the bell on the, on the giving up on matter. <laughs> Rachel, that's that, called the Gnostic bell. <laughs> yeah. Every oh, time Gnosticism you. comes up, we're supposed to ring the bell. It's everywhere, um, so. It's everywhere. Yeah, it's going to show <laughs> <Yeah>. up a lot. <laughs> yeah. So this has been wonderful. Let's wrap up and do some recommendations before we go. Um, I'll go first, actually. I realized <laughs> I forgot to introduce myself at the oh. beginning when you guys introduced yourselves. I was, I was you wondering. I thought, I thought yeah, you were well, just assuming everyone knew you. I mean, that would be <laughs> easier. Um, but in, instead of doing that... Or introducing myself, I'm just going to make my recommendation super self-promotional. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> um, I am recommending a different podcast that I'm on <laughs> called Make Me a Swifty, where my friend Savannah tries to make me a fan of Taylor Swift. Um, yeah. How is that so, going? It's. I mean, I think she asked me to put a number on it recently, and I think we hit 30%. Which is, you know, it's a failing but, but, grade. But, but where, where did you did start you, from? Where did you start, though, is the issue. I started with uh, incalculable because I hadn't listened to <laughs> any. I am right there with you, Emily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, th- yeah, that's what, what we've been up to lately. Um, I'm kind of the uh, musical and textual analysis kind of person. And Savannah's not like me. She's cool. So <laughs> we make a good team. <laughs> Um, and we're, we're having a good time. So if you want to hear more of my voice for some reason, um, go listen to that. And how would people find this? Oh, well, you would search, make me a Swifty on any podcast catcher. Oh. Yeah. Swifty is spelled I E. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. Yeah. If, I would have used a Y. So yeah, yeah it's, too. it's not a Y okay. it's an I E. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Greg, do you have a recommendation? Well, I already made mine. It's Henry Van Til's book, The Calvinistic Concept or Conception, I forget, 
of culture. It's an older book, um, but it looks at how uh, Christians, and particularly Calvinists, have looked at culture and its relationship to the gospel. And it is a profound book, but I think most people would find it within their reading ability. But it's the kind of book you read with a, a highlighter in one hand, a pen in the other, and you don't plan to get more than a few pages you <laughs> sit down. But it, the vocabulary is, is very understandable, and uh, there is a great deal that's very worth reading. So, The Calvinist Conception of Culture, I believe, is the title. Henry Van Til. Not Cornelius Van Til, Henry Van Til. And are, they in, are they related? I believe so. I think it's a nephew, uncle thing, but I couldn't swear to that without looking. <laughs> Rachel, do you have a recommendation for us? Um, I do. I actually made this recommendation to you recently, Emily. Oh, and good. I, I was hoping you would say this again so that I could okay. remember the title. <laughs> yes, I know. This is how it goes. And Greg, maybe you've heard of this. Maybe you were even the one that recommended it to me. I can't remember who told me mm. to read this book. Um, but the book that I've been reading is called The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization by Vishal Magawadi. And it's a fascinating book that honestly reminds me of your teaching, Greg, a lot. Oh. Um, but it's a man who's coming out of Indian Hinduism oh. and went to a secular university in India and then went, neither of these can account for the technology that we're enjoying from the West. And yet we put down Western civilization as highly oppressive and everything bad that yes. we don't want to be. And yet somehow we got all these things from them. And it doesn't make sense. And so he went on a journey and became a Christian, essentially a spiritual journey. And he's then evaluating Hinduism and the cultures that want to reject God mm. and yet want to th enjoy all of Western cultures, technology. Um, and it has quite a few stories from him living in India as a Christian, where in facing Indian culture, where they're mm. like, sure, we can kill our daughter who's sickly. She doesn't serve us any purpose. We don't see any reason to save her. Um, and so it's just, it's fascinating. And he's mixing in like Kurt Cobain with Bach <laughs> and he's just like all over the place. But it's really that without the God of the Bible who starts as creator, um, nothing that we have today would be as it is. So, so it's, the name again. The Book That Made Your World. Hmm. So if you haven't okay. heard of it, I, I definitely I have not it. heard of that. I've heard of okay. other books along those lines, but they're all written by Westerners for Westerners. So this sounds like it would be a gem. It's, it's so fascinating as he contrasts the Hindu gods and other gods, Islamic mm -hmm. God, um, with, with the Christian God and says, we do this because God does this. We do this because God, mm -hmm. because God, because God um, from the Bible. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a worthwhile book to, I'm going to be purchasing it because I've been borrowing it from the library. <laughs> but I need to get my own copy now. Okay. It's always Excellent. good to find those that are worth spending money on, which is why I use the library. It's a great way to <laughs> pull through all the books. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for this conversation. It's been a delight. Uh, big thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters who help us keep the show rolling, pay for microphones and such, uh, and software and things like that. Um, thanks to you, our listeners. We hope you'll join us again soon. <laughs> <laughs>